tonight, I think I got an assignment to the book of Mark, chapter number one, to the book of Mark, chapter number one. Glory to God. You know it's God when you start moving stuff around. I'm a little rowdy sometimes. This will be coming from the NLT version. I have a manuscript of what God gave me, I believe, which preachers becomes logos. But when it's time to deliver, how many mothers in the room know that things don't always go like they planned? So I'm praying that the logos becomes rhema. This version will be the NLT version, Mark chapter number one. I'll read six verses. I'm really only reading it for verse one and six, but I want to give you context. And then we will also read Mark chapter number three. And the word of God reads as thus. This is the good news. Somebody say good news. About Jesus, the Messiah, the son of God. Mm. Now, see, if I was in Firehouse with our youth in the chapel, we just, we'd be shouting already. Let me say something. Your teenagers are on fire. So if you sit here dead, listen, I got a whole Firehouse crew. We're going to take over this sanctuary. I'm just telling you now. I brought back up just in case you didn't say amen. This is the good news. What is it? About Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. It began just as the prophet Isaiah had written. Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare your way. Mm. He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare ye the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. Verse 4, this messenger was John the Baptist. He was in the wilderness. Somebody say wilderness. A dry place and preached anyway that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. Last couple of verses. All of Judea, including all the people of Jerusalem, went out to see and hear John, and when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. Lord, have mercy. Now, this is getting ready to be my favorite part. Verse 6, his clothes were woven from coarse camel hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist, for he ate locusts and wild honey. What did he eat? Somebody put wild honey in the chat. Wild honey. Wild honey. Mark chapter number 3. We're going to read this one from the old school King James Version. Now, how many of y'all grew up in that old school church where you got to read the King James or you weren't saved? Y'all know what I'm talking about. This is referring to Jesus. And he entered again, somebody say again, into the synagogue. And there was a man there which had a withered hand. Somebody say withered hand. And they watched him whether he would heal him on the Sabbath that they might accuse him. And he saith unto the man which had the withered hand, stand forth. Jesus didn't care that it was a Sabbath. And he said unto them, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath day or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they held their peace. This made Jesus angry. And when he had looked around about them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their heart, he said unto the man, stretch forth, stretch forth your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. Last verse. And the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. Lord, have mercy. Before we pray, I want to remind you that John the Baptist ate locusts and wild honey. What kind of honey was it? 
I think we've got a picture of what it might look like to eat wild honey. Can we show that picture for the wild honey? Yeah. Just get a real good look at that. Because you don't eat wild honey without getting stung. But let's back it up. Let's, 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 because, because the real text is on the man with the withered hand. We have a brief video we want to show you, about 14 seconds long. I want to show you something that has been withered. TV, take it away. So it just fell down. Mm. My subject today before we pray is don't give up. I don't know who this word is for. You might want a direct message, DM. You might want to send this to about 10 people in your family. But the Lord told me to tell you, don't give up. Father, I pray that you would hide me behind your cross. Do what only you can do, Daddy. Let the devil know who's boss in this place so that your people walk away encouraged, strengthened, with their head held high and full of inspiration and motivation that you are the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and the glory of glories so that they would not give up you might be seated in the presence of the Lord. The definition of the word courage is to do something that frightens you. In other words, having courage means you have the bold, intrepid faith to do something that has never been done before or that challenges you at your core to get you out of your comfort zone. I have a Hall of Fame list of those who I believe are extremely courageous. Helen Keller, she lost both her sight and her hearing, but she still published a book. She was a bad woman. It took courage. Marcus Garvey, in the early 1900s, shortly after the uh, abolishment of slavery, taught African Americans how to have wealth when it was illegal for them to learn how to read, and they had just actually gotten books placed in their hands. It took courage. Benjamin Banneker, in the 1700s, became an astronomer and a mathematician at a time when you really weren't supposed to be reading, he still became the scholar that God called him to be. Ann Richards, who was a governor of Texas in the 80s, stood up for the rights of women, minorities, and everybody in a marginalized community. It took courage. Oprah Winfrey, at a time whereby uh, it was not popular to talk about abuse and shame and rape, got on national television and began to tell her story and everybody began to say, me too, it took courage. Cesar Chavez stood up at a time when also Mexican immigrants did not have the fullness or weren't treated with the fullness of civil rights. He stood up for farmers and labor unions. It took courage. Bishop T.D. Jakes, with about seven or nine people, I've seen the old school church. It was the size of a little bit larger than a garage, kept preaching and teaching until God blew it up. And now we have the Potter's House of Dallas, Texas, where we've had over 40,000 members and sometimes 100,000 watching online. It's going to take courage. Anything you do in life is going to take courage. If you are looking for things to be easy, to be handled, it to you to just be given on a silver spoon you are in the wrong church the wrong world and in the wrong mindset it is going to take courage and really all you have to do is ask yourself about three questions who are you where are you going and what has God called you to do who are you 
where you're going, and what does God call you to do? Who are you? Your beauty in motion. You are an unwrapped gift. You are a millionaire in the making. You are a real estate mogul. You are a gem and a diamond that is cut out of a hill called the unique you that has not been discovered yet. You are a world changer. You are a trendsetter. I'm just talking about you. You might as well shout for you. You are somebody that the world has been doubting and stepping over, but you are the comeback kid. You are somebody that God is getting ready to raise up. You are super fragile, casualistic, expialidocious. You are a prophet. You are a teacher. You are the successful person that is getting ready to be promoted. That's who you are. You come from the fine particles of the dust. God made you and he formed you and shaped you because he just said, let me blow my breath into her. Let me blow my breath into him because they're going to be a bad somebody. That's who you are. That's who you are. Where are you going? You're going to the top. <laughs> Where are you going? You're going to success. Where are you going? You're going to promotion. Where are you going? Some of you are getting ready to go to the White House. Some of you are getting ready to go at a table where the, where the, where the food is going to be spread and laid out for you. That's getting ready to be a celebration for you. People are getting ready to take you to higher heights and deeper depths. Where are you going? You're going to success here. Where are you going? Not only are you going to millionaire status, or not only are you going to debt freedom, you're going to a company called an S Corp. You're going to a company called a C Corp. Let's upgrade it a little bit. Some of you are getting ready to create joint ventures. Some of you are getting ready to create conglomerates. Where are you going? You are going to a level that you dreamed about. You are going to a destination that has your last name on it. You are going to a destination that your grandparents prayed about. Where are you going? You getting ready to go to VIP status. Where are you going? You getting ready to go to a place where they just say, you know, how, how can I help you, sir? Well, uh, what, what do you need, man? You are getting ready to go to a high society. That's where you're going. That's where you're going. I said it, that's where you're going. The devil don't want you to receive that. That's where you're going. That's where you're going. Get your head up. Get, listen, get, let's, get, put your hand, you, you've been having your hand out. You might as well put your hand in your pocket and start whistling because you don't need a handout for where you're going because God's getting ready to give you handfuls on purpose. you just getting ready to get unexpected checks in the mail. You're getting ready to get things that you never even dreamed about. You're getting ready to get, get deeds and contracts and real estate and land's about to be passed to you. Oh, and I didn't even tell you about your inheritance. What do, you, what do I mean inheritance? You're a king's kid. You're a king's daughter. Who are you? You're the daughter of the most high. Who are you? You're a woman of excellence. Who are you? You're a man of integrity. Who are you? You're a world shaker. You, oh God. I'm, I'm, I'm starting too early. I, I, I need to try to slow it down. But let me tell you something. The devil all wants you, always wants you to confuse who you are and where you're going. But the real question is how are you going to get there? Well, the word of God is littered with the destiny's trail. The Word of God is littered with your path and how you get to your destiny. The Word of God is littered with what you need as a road map. The Word of God was the first Google Maps. The Word of God was the first Maps Go. The Word of God was the first turn left at the corner, turn right by the old lady, turn left when you see the bow-legged kid, turn right at the ice cream store. The Word of God is getting ready to be not only your telescope, your microscope. The Word of God is going to be your guide. That's why I'm glad you came to Bible study tonight. That's why I'm glad you tuned on tonight because this is where we get orders from headquarters. This is where we get instructions for our destiny. You are getting ready to go somewhere, but you cannot go anywhere until you dig into God's Word. When we start in the book of Mark, we are noticing that John Mark is this amazing writer. Y'all know John Mark. I used to be mad at John Mark because he left the apostle Paul and deserted him in Pamphylia. I used to be real mad at Mark because he left Pamphylia and went to Jerusalem. Can we teach this a little bit in Bible study? I used to be mad at Mark, but then I got to realize that Paul himself was not perfect and Paul himself used to be a Christian killer and sometimes Paul just wanted to get in trouble. Have you ever had that friend? They always start in fights. They always start in trouble. Like Paul, I'm not even sure did the Spirit tell you to go to Pamphylia? You notice that the text sometimes would say that the, that the Spirit forbade Paul to go. It restrained him in a certain place. But listen, Paul didn't care. He was willing to lay down his life anyway. So John Mark says, listen, there's no need of both of us dying. Somebody need to live to tell a story. So I had to forgive John Mark. You know John Mark. 
John Mark, who, who writes the book of Mark a little bit later, 65 to 70 AD, and John Mark writes it with words like straightway and immediately. He uses words like straightway and immediately some 40 plus times, but you won't really understand it until you understand who Mark was. Mark was a black man according to history. Mark's mother's name was Mary. According to history, his father was named Aristotle. Mark grew up in the house with Jesus and the disciples coming around. Mark was a disciple of Peter. You know Peter cussing Peter. You know Peter revelation Peter. You know Peter the one who cut Malchus's ear. You know Peter walking, water walking Peter. Peter would do anything because he was bold and he was courageous. So John Mark had all of that in him plus the handprint of what his father and mother gave him. It is noted according to history, first of all, biblically Acts 12 and 12. Y'all okay with this? We, we good? Can I just teach the word of God? Listen, I feel like a pregnant woman with twin tuplets in my gut. I got to deliver this word. Mary in Acts 12 and 12, it is noted that this is where Peter comes to after the angel breaks Peter out of jail. You remember the angel smote the chains and the chains fell off and Peter came back and he's knocking on the door. He says, listen, God has heard your prayer, church. Have you ever prayed for something and God delivered it, but you forgot to answer the door? That's some of y'all's problem right now. Let me just parenthetically pause right there. God has answered your prayer, but you haven't gotten off your laurels and wouldn't got the answer. God has answered your prayers, but you have not walked into what you need to walk into. He's knocking on the door and Rhoda says, that's Peter. She runs back and tells everybody, but she forgets to open the door. That house was Mary's house. That house was Mark's mother's house. So Mark grew up around miracles. Mark grew up around world-changing anointing. Who am I talking to? I'm talking to those of you who grow up in church. I'm talking to those of you who've been Pentecostal, Baptist, Presbyterian, Catholic, but you've seen the miracle wonder workings of God. I'm talking about some of you who came from the streets. I'm telling you, you've seen miracles, and every time you see a miracle in your past, it is a foreshadowing or what's coming in your future. What happened to when the church would break out in spontaneous praise? Do I have anybody who would just magnify for just being able to breathe? Do I have anybody who would just magnify because I can lift my hand? Can I have somebody who would just magnify I'm like, I can open my mouth. Do I have somebody who could magnify me? I could use the bath. Wait a minute. I could tie my own shoe. I could dress myself. I could comb my hair. I could put out my hand. I could, wait, I can see? What, what, what? Don't wait till you get to the hospital to ask God for a miracle. Whatever. See, some of you have been raised in church around miracles and anointings and the power of God, and you're going to come sit here in the new generation like you don't owe God a praise. You're going to come sit here in a new generation like you don't owe God a thank you, Jesus. You're going to come sit here like you don't owe God a hallelujah. All that God's done for you. Oh, 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 y'all. Oh, you're going to make me prophesy now. You know you would still be drinking. You know you still have a needle in your arm. You know that you still be watching www.bigboo.com. You know that you... I wish you would. I wish you would. I got thieves in the audience. I got ex-adulterers in the audience. I got fornicators in the audience. I got lies. Some of y'all mad right now. I got rage in the audience. I got... For... I got idolaters in the audience. I got people who hate themselves. I got people who hate what they do. I got people in this sanctuary who hate the very breath of their life because on the inside you have forgotten to praise God for little things. I just praise him for little things. Like, I, I, can, 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 can I just, can I give you a quick testimony? I'm studying, I'm doing all I can do. Believe in God, I'm fasting and praying and hallelujah, blah, blah, blah. you know, we, we, just, we just go into it, praise God. My wife walked out the shower, I said, my God, that's a distraction. But I started praising God because I'm married. I remember there was a time I wasn't married. See, that was for all the people who really are in love in their marriage. I know a lot of men who are married, but they don't really love their wives. I know a lot of women who are married, but they don't really love their husbands. It's, it's time for you to just get real and honest and just thank God for simple things. Like, I said, man, she walked around. Look, look at, I said, ooh, wait till I teach Bible. So that's why I'm trying to rush through this right now. God will give you a praise about anything. Oh, you think I'm playing five, four, and some more. Size seven and a half shoe with that cocoa hit in the East Texas wall. I'm telling you with the way she dropped her hair, the way she got the dimples, the way she said, oh, hey, baby, how you doing? The way she says, Vin Shirt, the way she say my, oh, God. Oh, God, I'll praise him for anything. But until you start willing to be able to praise God for anything and look like a fool, your blessing will be held up. 
until you start praising God for, wait a minute, wait a minute, what, what, wait, what, God, I dress myself, I can walk, oh my God, me and my manager not arguing today, oh God, I still have a job, oh God, listen, listen, I don't know how I'm going to make it, I've been laid off my job, but money came in the mail, oh, I still got a client today, oh, do I have anybody who would just magnify God? I remember there were times when I would have to put change in the offering and fold it up and pass it down and tell the next person, don't you say nothing, you just pass it on down. I don't want them to hear that change. But now you got the nerve to be able to put tens and twenties and hundreds and thousands in the offering. You owe God a praise. You owe him a thank you, Jesus. You owe him a hallelujah. You owe, you owe him the glory. So Mark tried to make sure Y'all can be seated. Well, you know, y'all going to make me preach a little bit. See, because Mark grew up giving God glory, and he grew up in a house where they gave, oh, it's nothing like a house that would praise God. I heard my wife this morning on a prayer call. I said, oh, my God. She tried to go downstairs, but I can still hear. Some of you need to go back to old school prayer. Like, I plead the blood. I plead the blood over your mind. I plead the blood over your purse. I plead the blood over your wallet. I plead the blood over that car. I plead the blood over that mess. I plead the blood over the beefy. I plead the blood over the con. What do I have anybody who will plead the blood? No, 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 no. See, the old school, the, the moment I said plead the blood, I would have saw about 10 old school women who about 70 years old walking around laying hands on people because it's the blood. Mark grew up with that old school kind of anointing. I believe Mary was pleading the blood. History says, I started researching this. I've never really seen this before, Pastor Slaughter. And I, history says that in Mark's mother's upper room is really where they believe that the Last Supper took place. So I said, wait a minute. That's why, Marshall, that Mark wrote words like straightway and immediately. Let me explain. Because Luke writes 19,600 words according to some scholars. I disagree with it because sometimes I'm a brainiac. Matthew writes 18,500 words, but yeah, I kind of disagree with him, but it's a whole lot of words. John writes 15,000 words, but Mark only writes over 11,300 words because Mark wanted to get straight to the point. Mark was the type of person that said, I want it done yesterday, but why was Mark like this? Mark was like this because he grew up around church folk who used to lie. Because you're one way on the outside, but on the inside. Je Is this a cutting word? Jesus says, on the outside, you look like whitewashed walls, but on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. And to make it make sense, the Lord said, keep searching, keep searching. And I looked according to research, and I said, oh, wait a minute. So if John Mark was at the table at the Last Supper as a kid, he was running around playing as a kid, and here's the Last Supper. Perhaps John Mark heard Jesus say, is he, who's that, is he who's dipping his hand in the cup with me, who sups with me, that shall betray me? So Mark learned not to trust church folk. Mark, I'm, I'm not bashing the church, I'm just talking about actually living a godly life. Mark learned that you could say one thing with your mouth, but then have to say, is it I? Is it I? No wonder he's writing words like straightway and immediately. So Mark said, let me just get to the point. I don't need to, I don't need to uh, placate this because I know what it's like to be at the table with Jesus and somebody be at the table who wants to betray him. It's not the people that are far from you. It's the people that are close to you. It's the people that you know. It's the ones you do the most for. It's the ones you, listen, you, you helped them out. You gave them money. You gave them right. It's the people that you pour everything else that are close to you that you have to worry about being your enemy. So in Mark chapter number one, this is why Mark opens up and he says, this is the good news of Jesus the Messiah. Lord have mercy. He says, this is the good news. I got good news tonight. Somebody's getting ready to be promoted. I got good news tonight. Somebody's life is getting ready to be changed. I got good news tonight. If you're listening to the hospital, there's healing that's about to come to your bed. I got good news tonight. If you're listening from a prison, you never know. You might get an early release. I got good news tonight. The thing that you've been struggling with the most is about to be over. I got good news tonight. The thing that's been keeping you up is about to allow you to go to sleep. I got good news tonight. Your mess is about to be turned into a message. I got good 
good news tonight. The thing that seems to be drama is about to be the dream of your future. I got good news tonight. Every setback is getting ready to be a setup for the glory of God. I got good news tonight. Your pain is about to be turned into power. I got good news tonight. Every time you thought you failed, every time you thought you were frail, God is getting ready to produce fruit on the other side. I got good news tonight. Every time you were seeking God and seeking God and believing God for more and more and more, on the other side of that is success. I got good news tonight. Things are about to turn around. I got good news tonight. Not many days from here, you getting ready to be smiling and whistling and walking out because God's getting ready to bless you. God's getting ready to anoint you. God's getting ready to take care of your enemies. God's getting ready to do what you could not do. God is getting ready to stand up for you. Somebody just needs somebody to stand up for. God's going to fight your battle. God's getting ready to judge the people who've been judging you. God is getting, oh, I, I, I hear the prophetic in my head. God's getting ready to do a work in your family, and you don't even have to argue with nobody anymore. God is getting ready to vindicate you. You've been called. Everybody know you called, but they've been denying your call because your call is a threat to their kingdom. God is getting ready to do, I, I don't know who I'm talking to, but God is getting ready to do something that you couldn't understand, that you couldn't even do yourself with all of your morality issues. God is getting ready to do some things. I got good news tonight. I got good news tonight. He says, this is the good news of Jesus, the Messiah. Lord, have mercy. You got to help me, Chris. Y'all should have just kept singing because when, when, when I start talking about the Messiah, oh my God, the Messiah, wait a minute, the Messiah, you don't understand, Marcus, and the Messiah is here. They prophesied it all through the first 39 books. The Messiah is here. He's saying Jesus is on the scene. You not understand what I'm saying. He's saying El Elyon, the most high God is here. He says El Roi is here. They, El Roi, that means the God who sees. He says El Olam is here. That's the everlasting God. He's saying El Shaddai is here. What is El Shaddai? If you study it, it means the many-breasted one. That means a breast like a man and a breast like a woman. That means a breast like a man for protection, a breast like a woman with, with production. That means God says, I got so many places for you to drink, you don't need to be thirsty. Jehovah Jireh is here. He's your provider. Jehovah Nisi is here. He's your banner against the enemy. What is a banner? That means a sign that says this far and no further. Back up devil. Back up demons. Back up rejection. Back up depression. Back up anxiety. Back up people who've been talking to me. I got good news. Oh God, I got good news. Jesus. Jesus is on the scene. Who am I talking? Jehovah Tiskanu. He's the Lord God our righteousness. Wait a minute. You, 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 all your righteousness is good as filthy rags, but he's the Lord our righteousness. He is Jehovah Rohi. Wait a minute. Your Rohi, that means he's, the, he's your shepherd and you shall not want. See, that's what I was trying to tell you why I praise God. Because when I saw my wife, I said, Lord, that's, look, you, you're my shepherd and I see what I want. Listen, I'm trying to tell you. He says, Jesus, the Messiah, is on the scene. He says, I got good news that Jesus is here. And the Bible makes a footnote, and then I want to park right here and try to teach and give you my assignment. Not only is Jesus here, but Mark 1 told us that John the Baptist is here. I, I, you you, 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 you got to help me, Minister Kev. You, 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 I don't understand. You got Jesus, the Messiah, and John the Baptist? You got two powerful houses on one stage called the world. Let, let, let me explain to you what I'm saying. John the Baptist was on the scene baptizing. It's John the Baptist who says, oh, that's him. Behold, the spotless lamb of God. Why would John say behold if John had to trace that in the garden of Eden that this was the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world? In Genesis, we find out that it's an innocent lamb. But in Exodus 12, we find out what to do with the lamb's blood. The lamb's blood must be applied. And just when I thought that it was the lamb's blood being applied, you remember they applied the lamb's blood on the doorposts. You remember? On the doorposts and the... Can I work it for you? It was on the doorposts and the lentils. It was on the doorposts. That's horizontal. And the lentils, that's vertical. This lamb in Genesis, blood has to be applied in the shape of a cross. It's Bible study, right? And then just when I found out what to do with the lamb's blood, I found out that David says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. So this lamb provides. And then Isaiah says, he was wounded for our transgressions. Wait a minute, Isaiah, slow down. I thought the lamb was an animal 
but I find out that the lamb is actually a man. So Isaiah said, this is a man, but we don't know which man it is. So it's John the Baptist that's pointing out, behold, the spotless lamb of God. Jo John the Baptist is pointing out, said, this is the man that you've been talking about for 40 and two generations. John the Baptist is on the scene. And this ain't, I'm, I'm like, this, I haven't even got to any of my points. B Bishop, just tune off. Tune off. I take my whip and lay it. I'm just... Blame it. It's the Holy Ghost. You know, when preachers get in trouble, be like, it was the Holy Ghost. And I start preaching and laying hands. Let me stick to my assignment. John the Baptist is who I want to park on for a moment. I don't want to talk about the camel's hair. I don't want to talk about anything else. I want to talk about his diet. John the Baptist ate locusts and wild honey. So if he ate locusts and wild honey, I understand why he would eat locusts because it would be a particular delicacy in some countries, protein, and according to the wings, depending on the, typ the, the typical type of locusts, it would be vegetables. Kind of nasty, right? He was dry and in the wilderness. But the text says something that caught my attention. It says John the Baptist ate wild honey. This means that he got stung a lot, Pastor Robs. I don't want to put anything in the text that's not there, but typically you don't eat wild honey and snatch wild honey from a beehive and not get stung. And the Lord started talking to me, and he says, tell my people that the reason that they have given up is because every time they reach after something, they get stung. Uh-huh, uh-huh. That's what he told me. Because life's been stinging you. Jobs been stinking you. Rejection's been stinking you. Depression's been stinking you. Anxiety's been stinking you. People been stinking you. An ailment in your body has been stinging you. Your bank account has been stinging you. Credit card debt has been stinging you. The, 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 the fact that your credit score is not the way you need it to be has been stinging you. Life will sting you. But reach after anyway. John the Baptist is a sign that the man with the withered hand has hope. What was the man with the withered hand reaching after before his hand became deformed, paralyzed, and withered? You've been down in your spirit because something stung you. They hurt your feelings and it stung you. They rejected you and it stung you. And John the Baptist would go in the beehive and get the wild honey because it was sweet. And on the other side of something sweet is something bitter that you're dealing with right now. I came to talk to the people who are in a difficult situation. You're in a painful situation. I've been preaching too many years to not know that you could come in looking good and smelling good, but somebody in this place is at their breaking point because something has stung you. On the other side of that bitterness is something sweet. John the Baptist is a revelation to say, listen, don't stop reaching after stuff just because you get stung. And I believe, I got to go to my notes here, it's been head knowledge thus far. I believe that there's a correlation between John the Baptist and the man with the withered hand. I just need just a few moments to prove it to you. I believe that there's a correlation. If you're watching, you can type some of this in the chat between the hand of John the Baptist and the hand of the man with the withered hand. John the Baptist's hand never withers because yet he would be handcuffed in the future and taken to prison by the Pharisees. So he knew what it was like to have a hand that was bound like the hand with the withered hand, like the man with the withered hand. John the Baptist's repentance, he preaches repentance, but yet the man with the withered hand's testimony preached repentance to the Pharisees because they should have caused it should have caused them to repent but they didn't want to heal him on the Sabbath. They, should, they never offered him healing. John the Baptist stretched forth his faith until Jesus shows up in the Jordan River, but the man with the withered hand stretched forth his faith until Jesus showed up in the synagogue. John the Baptist was in the wilderness, a dry place, but the man with the withered hand, he was in the wilderness because he was in a dry synagogue with Pharisees and Herodians. John the Baptist was a messenger 
and the man with the withered hand was a message to the people that it's okay to heal on the Sabbath. Can I give you a few more? John the Baptist baptized, which is a symbol of death, burial, and resurrection. You know that's what baptism represents. But the man with the withered hand is a sign that even though a part of you faced death and was buried on a, in a withered state, with no hope that Jesus could resurrect it and stretch it forth. The man with the withered hand had 27 bones. These are the 19 phalanges and the eight lunate bones. He had 27 bones in his hands, which was a combination of the phalanges that helped grab things and the lunate bones in the wrist that helped the hand pivot. John the Baptist begins the New Testament after the New Testament's 27 books with the pivot of repentance, which is a combination of the Old and the New Testament, so that we would grab after the hold the, the promises of God. Let me give you one more. John the Baptist stood in the Jordan River until Jesus came. The man with the withered hand sat in the synagogue until Jesus came and told him to stand. John the Baptist is standing in the wilderness. The man with the withered hand is told to stand by, the Jesus, by Jesus. And at the end of it, both of them are standing. There is a correlation here. I wanted to just talk about the man with the withered hand, but God said, I need you to understand that John's hand is akin to the man with the withered hand. What was the withered man with the withered hand reaching after? before his hand got paralyzed. To be paralyzed, to be stopped. That's what the devil wants to do to you. That's why you've been feeling those emotions. That's why you've been going through H-E double hockey sticks because the devil wants to stop your progress and he wants to paralyze who you are. If you could just keep everything in who you are and your shine on the inside, the devil would be happy. If you would just keep your praise and never say anything, the devil would be happy. If you would just never give God glory, then the devil would be happy. But the reason that he's after you is because something that is in you should be coming on the outside of you. So God said, I'm going to allow the man with the withered hand to be noticed in a synagogue in a synagogue in a synagogue that's what's kind of blowing my mind he's in a synagogue how can you come to church and have a withered hand I don't understand how, how can you come to church and sit in the back because the man with the withered hand he just sat in the back with the withered hand and some of you have been a, in an uncomfortable situation. You've been hurting so long. You've been dealing with what you've been dealing with so long that you just sit in the back. You don't want to get involved. You don't want nobody to see you. The man with the withered hand knew that some of the people up front, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, that they didn't care anything about him. Notice when we get to Mark chapter number three, it says that Jesus entered the synagogue again. That means that Jesus was there before this was not the first time I don't believe that Jesus saw the man with the withered hand. What do you do when God knows your situation and still doesn't change it? No, 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 no. I'm, I'm going to dig all the way in because some of you are really mad with God. What do you do when God hadn't answered you? What do you do when God didn't change the grief and the pain that you've been going through? What do you do when God did anoint your finances like you thought? What do you do when the equity went down in your house? What do you do when the deal went bad? What do you do when your daughter gets pregnant? What do you do when your son gets on drugs? What do you do when somebody in your relative goes back to jail and you tried to warn him, you tried to talk? What do you do when the habit comes up? I know, I know nobody in here, I know y'all don't have any habits what do you do when you got secret addictions that God is trying to de deliver you out of but you keep holding them on the inside because you can't tell anybody so you just sit at the back with a withered hand and it's amazing to me oh God I feel like running right here it's amazing to me that the withered walker walked by I know y'all going you religious folk you're gonna get mad at me the withered walker walked by so you just see God walking on water but Jesus himself was in a withered state. Jesus himself had to put off celestial and put on terrestrial. Jesus himself had to put off glory and put on an actual story. Jesus had to take off his purpose and put on his potential. Jesus himself, who never slumbered or sleep, had to learn how to take a nap. The God who created the universe has to learn how to create his own clothes and houses because he's a carpenter. What do you do when the when the withered God sees the man with the withered hand. I believe that Jesus understood what the man with the withered hand was going through. 
I know, I know. Now, now you, you, you just be really being religious. Let me, let me prove it to you. We were, first of all, Jesus is a withered God coming to a withered world. The, withered, the world, I, 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 this is going to be bad right here. Don't y'all tell nobody. It's going to be bad because sometimes I read God's word until it's just in me. I don't always read it to memorize it, but I read it and it just, when I hiccup, it comes out. When I sneeze, it comes out because I've been reading his word for years and years and years. And I found out that the world was in a withered state in the first 50 chapters of the book of Genesis when Adam and Eve ate the fruit. I found out that in the 40 chapters of the book of Exodus, the reason why they were trying to exit the wilderness is because they were in the wilderness state. I found out that in the 27 chapters of the book of Leviticus, the reason why they were trying to learn how to live holy is because the world was in the wilderness state. I found out in the 36 chapters of the book of Numbers, the reason why they were trying to count up in their own strip because the world was in the wilderness state. I found out in the book of Deuteronomy, 34 chapters, that the world was in the wilderness state, and that's why Moses had to receive the Ten Commandments and some 1,100 more. I found out in the 24 chapters of the book of Joshua, the reason why Joshua had to be only be that strong and courageous is because the world was in the wilderness state. I found out in the 21 chapters of the book of Judges that the reason why it says every man did what was right in his own eyes because the world was in the wilderness state. I found out in the book of Ruth the reason why she had to have a kinsman redeemer is because the world was in the wilderness state. I found out in the, 20, the 31 chapters of the book of 1 Samuel that the world was in the wilderness state. That's why they chose Saul instead of a king who God should have been their king a long time. I found out in the 24 chapters of the, y'all got to stop me sometime. I found out in the 24 chapters of the book of 2 Samuel the reason why God had to raise up David but David was on the backside of the desert because God would the, the world was in the wilderness. I found out in 22 chapters of 1 Kings that the reason why Elijah is anointed, but Elijah does seven great, seven to eight great miracles. And the, but in the 25 chapters of the book of 2 Kings, Elijah has a double portion. It's great to have a double portion, but what about 30, 60, and 100 fold and a thousand? That's because the world was in the wilderness. State. I found out in the book of 1 Chronicles, the 29 chapters and the 36 chapters, 1 and 2 Chronicles, I found out that the reason I had to write down and chronicle things that happened because the world was in the wilderness. State. I found out in the 10 chapters of the book of Ezra, the reason why they had to start, they had to start reading the word of God and bring it before the people is because the world was in the wilderness state. I found that the reason you're watching right now is because you're in the wilderness state. The reason why you need a word is you're in the wilderness state. The reason why you want to give up, you're in the wilderness state. The reason why you're having trouble in your marriage is because you're in the wilderness state. The reason why you're struggling with, oh God, I, I saw it in my head, I'm not going to even say it. The reason why you're struggling with sexual sins is because you were in the wilderness state. The reason why it's tough for you to keep your borders it's because the world is in the wilderness state. The reason why you don't keep your budget is because the world is in the wilderness state. The reason why you don't do what you're supposed to do is because you're in the wilderness state. I found out in the 13 chapters of the book of Nehemiah, the reason why Nehemiah built the, the, the broken down walls of Jerusalem in only 52 days, I said, that's amazing, but that's the only city that was rebuilt. It's because the world was in the wilderness state. I found out in the 10 chapters of the book of Esther, that the reason why Esther says, I go before the king. If I perish, I perish because the world was in the wilderness state. I found out in the book of Job, the 42 chapters, the reason why Job receives double for his trouble, but he almost cursed the day that he was born is because the world was in the wilderness state. I found out in 150 some, that we should say divisions of some, that David keeps praising and praising God is because the world was in the wilderness state. I found out in the book of Proverbs, the 31 chapters of the book of Proverbs, the reason why Solomon received wisdom from his mother because he didn't know what to do is because the world was in the wilderness state. I found out in the in the eight chapters of the book of Song of Solomon, y'all can stop me anytime. I found out in the eight chapters of the Song of Solomon, the reason why she's looking for her lover in chapter number three is because her lover has gone. The reason why some of you are really looking for love is because the world is in the wilderness state. I found out in the book of Isaiah, the 66 chapters of Isaiah, the reason why he's seen the Lord high and lifted up in his train filled the temple, but that's all he saw because the world was in the wilderness state. I found out in the book of Jeremiah, the reason why Jeremiah wanted to quit and it was like fire shut up in his bones in the 52 chapters because the world was in the wilderness state. I found out in the 48 chapters yeah, I'm, I'm sorry I haven't been up in a while. I just got to preach it. I got I to gotta get it out. I'm pregnant. I got to deliver. I'm sorry. I just, we just might as well have the stirrup of a microphone. Y'all just might as well get the water, the epidural. You might as well go call the, the midwife, whoever. Because I'm telling you, the world is in the wilderness state. I found out that in the book of Lamentations, these five chapters, the reason why Lamentations 3 and 23 says, great is our faithfulness, new are thy mercies every day. The reason why I got to have new mercies every day is because the world is in the wilderness state. I found out that, that the world was under, under the wilderness state in the book of Daniel, these 12 chapters that Daniel has to get discernment because he's getting ready to be thrown into a lion's den. Why would they throw a prophet into a lion's den? Because the world was in the wilderness. I found out in the book of Hosea that the reason these 14 chapters talk about the adultery of God's people against him, not really Gomar and Hosea, is because the world was in the wilderness. I found out in the book of Joel. Now, can I talk about Joel? He said, my sons and daughters will prophesy because the world was in the wilderness. I found out because sisters are only receiving 85 cents on the dollar. You know why they're mistreating your sisters? You know why there's misogyny? It's because the world is in the wilderness state. I found out that in the book of 
Jonah, the reason why Jonah runs and he runs and, and he gets swallowed by fish is because the world was in the wilderness. Why else would you want to preach repentance? Because the world was in the wilderness. I found out in the book of Micah, these seven chapters in Micah says, who was like the Lord? Who was like the Lord? It's because he was looking for somebody who was great and he couldn't find him because the world was in the wilderness. I found out in the book of Habakkuk, these three chapters, he says, write the vision and make it plain. The reason why he says, write the vision and make it plain, he has to keep writing and writing and writing. And some of you have to keep putting your vision out and the people don't understand, your team don't understand. Listen, this is the vision. This is the mission. These are the goals. This is the mission. It's because the world was in the wilderness. state. I found out in the book of Obadiah, this one chapter he's preaching to the Edomites, this prophet, the reason why he's preaching to the Edomites is because they're descendants of Esau and the descendants of Esau were still upset at their great, 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 great cousins. The reason is because Jacob and Esau, you remember the stealing of the birthright? Because the world is in the wilderness. state. The reason you struggle with forgiveness right now sitting in your seat but you're playing me off is because the world is in the wilderness. state. The reason why you tuned on right now but you're angry at somebody else, how can you praise God and still be angry? It's because the world is in the wilderness. Say, how could you praise God but then be mad at the person sitting next to you because the world is in the wilderness? Say, how could you come in here and not speak to the person next to you and even get to know their name or the number or their business or connection or organization? It's because you were in the wilderness. Say, I found out that not only was it Habakkuk, that it was Zephaniah. And the Zephaniah in these three chapters, that Zephaniah says, listen, uh, God always preserves a remnant. Why would there must be a remnant? Because the world is in the wilderness. Say, I found out in the book of Haggai in these two chapters would they have to rebuild the wall? It's because the world was in the wilderness. Say, I found out in the book of Zechariah these 14 chapters, the reason why these 14 chapters has Zechariah, the prophet has eight different visions, but he still doesn't see God clearly, is because the world was in the wilderness. Say, I found out in the book of Malachi as I try to close this portion of the segment of Bible study, but I feel like preaching right now, is because in the book of Malachi, these four chapters, but it's in Malachi chapter number three, he said, behold, the messenger is coming. Wait a minute, you thought I was lost. He said, this is the, this world is in the wilderness state because the messenger has to come and deliver the world from the, from, from a wilderness state. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, the messenger is coming, but Mark's saying the messenger is here. Y'all don't know a good place to shout. When the messenger comes, you got to give him glory. So this is why Mark said, the messenger is coming. Behold, behold. He, that's why he said John the Baptist, behold, here comes the spotless Lamb of God. Because Mark knew that the messenger was coming. And after, after 39 different chapters, after 30, excuse, 39 different books, after, oh, oh my God. After 929 chapters, let me slow it down. This is the Old Testament. After 929 chapters, which is the equivalent of 39 books in the Old Testament, you do know that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, but the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. So this, after this bridge appeared between Malachi and the Gospels, they call it the period of silence because in these 400 years, God doesn't speak again according to people because what, why would God say anything if he've already said something and you're supposed to do what you're supposed to do anyway? It's like your mother saying, I told you to take out the trash. Why should I tell you it again? And, you, and you, you're wondering why your mother is silent. Did you complete the first task? And some of you want to be promoted on your job, but your manager gave you an assignment. Did you get the credits? Did you learn? Did you get training and development? Did, were, did, were you nice to the customers? Did you focus on what you were supposed to? And you're wondering why the promotion hasn't come. Because not only are you in the, in the with the state, but there must be silence until there is change. There is a silent frustration with the man with the withered hand. So he sits in the back of the synagogue and he's frustrated and he just sits here and he's with it. We talked about the sting. I wish I could tell you what the sting was. I'm not saying that he was stung by a bee because you keep thinking a sting is physical, but a sting can be more mental than anything. A sting can be more silent than anything. A sting can be more psychological than anything. A sting can be so emotional that you don't even know how to articulate. Some of you in this room, I feel you in my gut right now. You're so frustrated because you don't know how to articulate how you feel. But it's not really your articulation. It's the fact that nobody else understands how you feel because you've been had this thing on the inside of you for such a long time. And you think my, my spouse would know it. My job should know it. My cousin should know it. My sister should understand it. My brother should see it. But on the inside of you is witheredness. It's just not withered on the outside. This man with the withered hand is representative of the video that I showed you. And I start digging into witheredness. Really witheredness, elder, is the lack of water. Anything withered lacks water. 
The chrysanthemums don't look good. The roses don't bud. The tulips don't look good. The, the wildflowers don't look amazing. The blue bonnets don't come because they lack water. You need the hydration and the water of God's word. That's why I had to take time and go through the Old Testament because God told me to tell you that his people has disavowed his word. You listen to more videos on social media. Can I just, it's a light little tap. It's not a real spanking. You listen to more videos on social media than you actually open up your Bible and read it yourself. There are 365 days in the year. 365 days in the year. If you just read one chapter a day, within three years, you would read the entire Bible. Fast forward, if you, you want to read it in a year, if you read three chapters of the Bible per day, you would be finished with the entire Bible in a year. But you keep complaining about your situation because you don't have answers, but your answer is in a book that you don't open up and read. I'm not afraid of you. I love you. And I'm going to tell you the truth, even if it hurts. You know, your mom and daddy will be like, it's going to hurt me more than more. I'm like, what? No, I'm the one getting a beating. But I understand because God is saying, I gave you free game, but you keep asking other people for instructions. I gave you a spiritual pathway to where you need to be, but you keep asking people what you need to do. In other words, you have glorified people over me, and I'm a jealous God. Let me tell you something. God will hunt you down like a jealous lover. God will key your car. He'll scratch your dress. He'll tear up your shoes. God will break into your house and say, wake up at 430 in the morning. And there's nothing wrong. There is nothing in your house. It's not a robber. It's the fact that you need to get up and turn over your face and praise God. You need to turn over your plate and begin to fast. You need to dig down and begin to worship. You got to praise him. You got to magnify him. You got to write the vision. You got to go after the grant. All I, oh, my. Because all I heard earlier when God says, I got good news, is I hear approved in the spirit. Approved. The house is approved. The car is approved. The loan is approved. But you don't know it's approved because you haven't been going after it with God's word and faith. Where is your faith? Get your faith at the bottom of your shoe. Your faith is not an insole. Get your faith up. See, the reason that you keep getting stung by other people and life is because the prophecy over your head is a threat to the people's current state and condition. You think they're mad at you, but it, they're mad at the anointing on your life. Why haven't you died yet? Why haven't they killed you yet? Why didn't it? Why didn't a car wreck work? Why didn't the drugs work? Some of you were withered by the time you grew up because you grew up without parents in the household. Some of you were withered by divorce. Some of you were withered by gunshots. Some of you were withered by disease. Some of you were withered by rejection. Some of you were withered by coaches. Some of you were withered by the lack of education. Why didn't it work? Why are you still standing here? I got to challenge you before I encourage you because God told me to tell you, don't give up. You cannot give up. Quitting is not the answer. You might have to watch YouTube videos. You might have to take night classes. You might have to do seminars and classes. You might actually have to go back to school. You might have to learn what AI is. You might have to study chat GPT, but you will succeed. Quitting is not the answer. You are somebody else's dream. Somebody prayed for you to become a millionaire. Somebody prayed for you to open up the business. Somebody prayed that you would get the courage to stop doing nails and hair on the side to actually open up a business. It's time to go from hustling to harvest. It's time to go from hustling to an LLC. It's time to go from an LLC to an S Corp and a C Corp. This is the season for you to believe in you. You've been believing in everybody else which is really low self-esteem, but I don't have time to deal with it. You've been believing in everybody else but you. When will you get out of the dungeon of a dream called not trusting God and you keep waking up to a nightmare every day? And the man with the withered hand came to a synagogue and the synagogue was dry just like the wilderness that John the Baptist was in. It was dry. 
it was parched. Nowhere in the text do I say that they were, do I really see that they were opening up God's word other than for religious, pious reasons. The lack of love. People say common sense is not common anymore. Love is not loving these days. What happened to love? What happened to peace? What happened to joy? What happened? Because some of you have secretly given up on love. I came to talk to the single people. Don't give up. Your husband could be in row 13, number B, five, peop five people over from the sister in the right shirt. You never know. Your wife could actually be the woman that you don't think you can actually afford because God is calling you to raise to a higher level. You're complaining about what you should be manifesting. The man with the withered hand is in the back with this withered hand sitting because being withered will call you, cause you to sit. Being stung by life will cause you to sit. And Jesus says, stand forth. In other words, he says, come here. Marshall, I need you to be the man with the withered hand. You're sitting. Come forth. That means you're coming in the middle. That means you're coming for everybody. I know they, they, they're not going to clap for you, but you still got to come anyway. They're not going to do anything, but you still got to come anyway. The reason why God... Jesus told the man with the withered hand to come forth, turn, face the crowd. The reason why he told them to come forth is because God is tired of you hiding in the shadows. God is tired of you hanging out in dark places when there's light on the inside of you. He's the light of the world. How can you be his representative if you're going to keep hanging out in darkness? He says, come right in the middle because I'm going to do my best work in front of everybody. Oh, God. God's getting ready to bless you. I don't know who I'm talking to. God's getting ready to bless you in front of everybody. All your family going to see it. The whole job will see it. All of the church is going to see it. You're watching me online. God's getting ready to bless you in front of everybody. When he says stand forth, he says come right in the middle of everybody. And while the man with the withered hand still has a withered hand, doesn't know what to do. He's ashamed of being in the front. Then Jesus looks at the Pharisees and Sadducees and says, and the Herodians, this is the Sabbath day. Should we do good or evil? God will answer your critics. He says, should we help people or harm people? Should we save life or kill? They said nothing. Watch out when the devil gets quiet. The devil's quiet because the power of God is a repellent to who he is. And when they got quiet, Jesus got angry. He got angry because he says, this was your time to repent. John the Baptist told you to repent. I'm telling you to repent, but you got a hard heart anyway. Stretch forth. And the man with the withered hand began to stretch forth his hand. And the hand, Luke says it was the right hand because that symbolizes power. That the hand became whole as the other. God's going to do it right in front of everybody. I don't know who I'm talking to, but the Lord told me to tell you to stretch forth. You ought to stand on your feet and stretch forth in praise. Stretch forth in worship. Stretch forth in business. No, this is your season to stretch forth. I don't know what you came for, but the Lord told me to, to stretch forth. This is your season to run through troops and leap over walls. This is your season to believe that you are more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. You are a lender and not a borrower. You are the head and not the tail. This is your season to believe that God has anointed you, to believe that God has chosen you. If God has chosen you, give him a praise. Thank you. Stretching forth is not easy. And just when I was getting ready to let the man with a withered hand off the hook. The Holy Ghost woke me up the other night and he said, the man with the withered hand had a withered hand, but what was wrong with his legs? You're complaining about something as if everything went down. God had never let everything go down at the same time. 
You cannot give up. You will not give up. As your associate pastor, I will not let you give up. I will hunt you down and say, why did you leave your wife? I will, you better ask somebody. I will hunt you down and say, is your husband beating you? Why did you leave? Is it your fault or his? Why did you go to counseling? Your arm is with it. But what's wrong with your ankles? I don't see in the text where there was something wrong with his ankles or his calf muscles or his knees. You're complaining about everything as if it's not the one thing that God told you that he can fix. And I want to do an altar call for those who felt like giving up. And giving up doesn't always look like not shouting because there have been people who have come in the house of God and shouted and go right out the doors and blow their brains out. It's not in a shout. It's natural and it's spiritual. It's coming to the altar and it's deliverance. It's getting counsel, it's, it's getting counseling, it's talking to a therapist, and sometimes it's taking medicine. I want to do an altar call for the people in this room who you know you're sitting on a dynamite type dream. Your idea is like Picasso and all you need is paint. Your mouth is like Paul Dunbar. You're writing, you're speaking, but for some reason that larynx is not flowing properly. In other words, it's tough for you to get out of you what he put in you. This is no time to be shameful. Because God cannot bless what you hide. I became a preacher because God was calling me. But my real gift is motivation. I know what it's like to be down and out and in the dumps. This is a dreamer's altar call. I had to confront you first because if you're going to lie to anybody, don't lie to yourself. Sometimes church will make you lie because you see other people shouting about something that you have not been delivered out of or delivered to. And I have learned to be honest about who I am with God. I've learned to be honest about my gift. I'm not like anybody else. My fingerprint is different. He broke the mold when he made me. My brain is different. There's a part of me fighting. Why didn't you tell him about the other 3,566,480 letters in the Bible? I'm built different. How are you built? And are you waiting on people to understand you before you step out on faith? You can't give up. Your mama's counting on you. Some of your mother's not even alive, but she prayed that you would be the woman God called you to be. Some of you left without even knowing the fullness of who your father was. You going to give up now? Doesn't your last name mean anything? It's not just African Americans. It's everybody in this room. If your parents made it to America, they came from great stock. In the bottom of slave ships were chains and feces and a fight. So only a percentage made it over the middle passage. In the bottom of those coming from Europe and other places were peasants, servants, indentured servants. For, you to, for your great, 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 great grandparents to even have made it across the Atlantic Ocean, or in some cases the Pacific Ocean, 
that means there's greatness in you. You got greatness in your DNA. But you keep labeling yourself as a failure because you're trying to measure up to somebody else. Really? That's what we're doing? Both Muggsy Bowles made it to the NBA. He was one of the shortest players, five foot four, five foot six or so. Spud Webb, five foot seven. And yet Yaming, who was over seven feet tall. The height difference wasn't what the contract was about. It was about gut determination. Who are you? Where are you going? And what has God called you to do? You know you're going to get there by his word. But my specific assignment is to challenge you to believe in you. I try to convince you with God's word. I wish we could just sit down and talk. Because sometimes preaching gets you inspired. And then you walk out and you get inflated. Because preaching on a stage is different than living out your actual life. I hear this in my spirit. Do what you can do. Jesus says, stretch forth. He knew that the man with the withered hand could stretch it forth. God's going to ask you to do something that you've never done before. I'm telling you, if I be a lying prophet, don't ever put me on the, don't ever give me the microphone again. Call me a liar, post on my page, say he lied. But I'm telling you, in the next three to four days, God's getting ready to ask you to do something that you've never done before. And all you have to do is obey him. That's it.